Good morning to our guests, speakers, presenters, faculty members, and students. Welcome to the second day of the ULEF Multicultural Conclave 2022. My name is Mehek Choudhury, as you've just heard. Um, I'm a lecturer at the Department of English and Humanities at ULAB. Yesterday, we experienced a whirlpool of ideas and notions which developed and challenged our conceptions of what it means to be a Bangladeshi and Bengali. Having stepped onto the 17th year of the language movement, we stopped to examine how far we have come along and also in which direction we would be heading towards. Interestingly, this year marks the centenary of the writing of our national poet, Kaji Nozul Islam's signature poem, Bidrohi. And it is only fitting for us to celebrate this at this conclave. So coming up, we have a panel discussion titled Bidrohi at 100, Resistance, Rebellion and Revolution, featuring Professor Rachel McDermott from Columbia University, Professor Kaiser Hawk from University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh, and Professor Anshuman Kaur, who would be joining us shortly, uh, from University of Budwan, with a special recitation of an excerpt of Bidrohi by Mr. Jamaluddin Bhuya, Deputy Registrar Admissions, ULAB. Without further ado, I invite Professor Rachel McDermott to step in and begin the session. Thank you. Thank you. It's really a delight to be with you. Uh, greetings from New York. Um, and uh, I'm most pleased uh, to be a part of this panel discussion. We thought we would do something slightly different um, this, um, in this panel, rather than having three um, lectures or three talks, that we would have one talk by um, Professor Kaur from uh, Bourdain University, and Professor Hawk uh, would give yes, a sir. reading. Kaiser, okay, would give a reading of his new translation of Bidrohi, and that I and he would engage in a small conversation about the choices he made and the ways he decided to do his translation. So, um, before we begin, I think we're going to have a recording of Bidrohi recited in Bangla. Um, by uh, your uh, re registrar, uh, Professor Bouya, and then uh, Professor Hawk will read his translation, and then he and I will have a conversation, uh, perhaps with Professor Kaur as well, and then Professor Kaur will give his paper, and at the end there will be time for uh, question and answer audience participation. So without further ado, if we have that recording, perhaps we could play that, and uh, I just want to thank uh, Mehek Choudhury and Arifa Rahman and uh, Shamsa Mortuza and everyone at ULAB for inviting me to be part of this exciting discussion. Abriti Kurchi, Kaji Nazrul Islamir, Bikhato Kobita, Bidrohi. Balabir. বলে উন্নত মামশির শিরিনে হারি আমারি নত শির ওই শিখর হিমাদ্রির বলবীর বল মহাবিশ্বের মহাকাশ ফারি চন্দ্র সূর্য গ্রহ তারা ছাড়ি ভোলক দোলক গোলক বেধিয়া খোদা আর আসন আরস ছেদিয়া উঠিয়াছে চির বিস্ময় আমি বিশ্ববিধাত্রীর মমললাটে রুদ্র ভগবান জলে রাজ রাজ টিকা দীপ্ত জয়শ্রীর বলবীর আমি চির উন্নত শির আমি চির দুর্দম দুর্বিনীত নিঃশংস মহাপ্রলয়ের আমি নটরাজ আমি সাইক্লোন আমি ধ্বংস আমি মহাভয় আমি অভিশাপ পৃথ্বীর আমি দুর্বার আমি ভেঙে করি সব চুরমার আমি অনিয়ম ও শৃঙ্খল আমি দলে যাই যত বন্ধন যত নিয়ম কানন শৃঙ্খল আমি মানি না কখনো আইন আমি ভরা তৈরি করি ভরা ডুবি আমি টর্পেডু আমি ভীম ভাসমান মাই আমি দুর্জটি আমি এলোকেশে ঝড় অকাল বৈশাখীর আমি বিদ্রোহী আমি বিদ্রোহী শুধু বিশ্ববিধাত্রী বলবি চির উন্নত শির আমি ঝঞ্ঝা আমি ঘূর্ণি আমি পথ সম্মুখে যাহা পাই যাই চূর্ণি আমি নিত্য পাগল ছন্দ আমি আপনার তালে নেচে যাই আমি মুক্ত জীবন আনন্দ আমি হাম্বির আমি ছায়ানট আমি হিন্দু আমি চলো চঞ্চল ঠমকি ছমকি পথে যেতে যেতে চকিতে চমকি ফিং দিয়া দেই তিন দোল আমি চপলা চপল হিন্দুল আমি তাই করি ভাই যখন চাহে এমন যা করি শত্রুর সাথে গলা গড়ি ধরি মৃত্যুর সাথে পাঞ্জা আমি উম্মাদ আমি ঝঞ্ঝা আমি মহামারী আমি ভৃতিয়ে ধরিত্রীর আমি শাসন ত্রাসন সংহার আমি উষ্ণ চির অধীর বলবীর আমি চির উন্নত শীর 
আমি চির বিদ্রোহী বীর বিশ্ব ছাড়াই উঠিয়াছি একা চির উন্নত শীর ধন্যবাদ Um, could I now ask Kaiser to read his uh, new translation uh, that just came out in the edited volume by Niaz Zaman, uh, newly translated um, poems, short stories, and uh, songs and essays of Nosrul. Thank you very much. Uh, I have tweeted at one of two places uh, after the publication of that uh, anthology, I think. Anyway, uh, here it is, The Rebel by Ghazi Nazrul Islam. Speak, hero. Say my head is held high. Seeing it, the Himalayan peak hangs down its head. Speak, hero. Say, Rending the cosmic skies, leaving sun and moon and planets and stars way behind, piercing mundane and heavenly spheres, right through the seat of divinity I have arisen, earth mother's immortal wonder child. Blazoned on my forehead is a fiery god's seal, a dazzling sign of royal triumph. Speak, hero, say, my head is ever held high. I'm haughty and fierce and invincible. I am the dancing god of doomsday. I'm a cyclone, I'm havoc. I am the ultimate terror, a curse on the world, irresistible. I smash all into smithereens. I am indiscipline and lawlessness. I trample over all bonds, all rules and regulations and restrictions. I heed no law. I sink the boat laden with merchandise. I'm a torpedo, a deadly floating mine. I'm wild-haired Shiva. I'm the sudden, untimely summer storm. I'm a rebel, Earth Mother's rebel son. Speak, hero. Say, my head is ever held high. I'm the rainstorm, the hurricane, smashing all in its path. I'm the dance crazy beast. I dance any way I please. I'm the joy of a life of total freedom. I'm a rich ensemble of musical modes. I'm restless, ever on the move, skipping and capering, doing as I please, whatever takes my fancy, whenever, wherever. I make friends with foes, hand wrestle with death. Oh, I'm raving mad. I'm the whirlwind, I'm the plague, the terror of this world, the dread of rulers, their slayer, ever restless. Speak, hero, say, my head is ever held high. I'm always recklessly drunk. I'm riotous. My soul's beaker always brims over with wine. I'm the sacred fire. I'm its attendant sage, Yamadagni. I'm the oblation and the priest. I'm the fire god, Agni. I'm creation, destruction, human habitation and cremation ground. I'm death, I'm dawn, I'm the son of goddess Indrani, the moon held in my hand, wearing the sun on my forehead, bamboo flute in one hand, war trumpet in the other. I'm poison quaffing Shiva in his myriad forms. I catch Ganga's wild torrent in my matted hair. Speak, hero, say, my head is ever held high. I'm a Bedouin, I'm Genghis, I bow to none but me, I'm thunder, I'm Om issuing from Shiva's horn, an apocalyptic blast from Israel's trumpet. I'm Shiva's Tabor and Trident, the staff in the hand of God Dharma. I'm the whirling disgust, the conch shell horn, the mighty Om. I'm a disciple of hot-tempered Durvasas and Vishwamitra. I'm forest fire, I will burn the world to cinder. I'm boisterous, open-hearted laughter. I'm the great terror opposed to all creation. I'm the eclipse of the 12 suns of apocalypse. Sometimes I'm serene, at other times turbulent, always willful. I'm the youthful, fresh blood of dawn. I crush the conceit of destiny. I'm luminous, I'm dazzling, I'm the water rippling, surging, waves dancing and swaying. 
and the fancy free maiden's flats, the flame in her narrowed eyes, the fiery passion in a teenage girl's heart lotus, I'm blessed. I'm the detached soul of the world renouncer. I'm the sigh from the bosom of widows in mourning, the lamentation of the luckless, <clears throat> the anguish of deprived, forever homeless wayfarers sleeping in the open. I'm the distress, the intimate agony of perennially rancorous hearts, the tremulous excitement of a girl's first stolen kiss. And this quick sidelong glance of a secret lover, the trysts that always come with deceit, a perky girl's romance, the tinkle of her glass bangles, and the eternal child, the perennial youth, and the protective bodice of the village bell, frightened of her own vitality, and the northerly and the southerly and the languid eastern breeze, and the wandering mistral's somber raga the song sung to a bamboo lyre, the unquenchable thirst of a summer noon, and the sun blazing in rage, and the murmuring spring of an oasis, the cool shadow of dark foliage. I advance in a mystic trance, utterly mad and possessed. I have found myself all of a sudden, all restraints have crumbled. I'm both rise and fall, I'm consciousness in the soul's unconscious depth, I'm mankind's victory pennant flying over the world's gateway. I fly like a gale loudly clapping. Heaven and earth lie beneath my palms. I ride the celestial mounts Borak and Chaisavas as the neigh high spiritedly. And the blaze from Baroba, the fire breathing uh, seahorse. And the volcano erupting out of Earth's breast, and the blaze from Badopa, the fire breathing seahorse, and fiery, and the drunken hubbub in the underworld ocean of fire. Snapping my fingers, I leap onto the wings of lightning and zoom off. I bring sudden terror and seismic tremors. I seize the hooded head of serpent king Vasuki. I twist off the flaming wings of the divine emissary Gabriel. I'm a god child, restless, audacious. My teeth tear into tatters, the earth mother's sari. I'm the flute of Orpheus. I tame the tossing sea. I bring sweet slumber to the whole world. I'm the flute in Krishna's hand. When I fly across the skies in a rage, the flames in the seven hells quiver in fear and die out. I sow rebellion all over the world. I am monsoon down downpour. I am the flood, fertilizing fields, at times wreaking havoc. I will snatch Vishnu's twin daughters from his breast. I am evil. I am a shooting star. I am Saturn. I am a flaming comet. I am the venomous black cobra. I am the headless Chandi. I am a warmonger bringing disaster. Amidst hellfire, I smile the smile of a blossoming bud. I'm all clay and I'm pure consciousness, ageless, deathless, imperishable, unchanging. I strike terror in man and demon and deity. None in the universe can trounce me. I'm the lord of the cosmos, the true human essence. I romp around earth and underworld and heaven. I'm surely a being possessed. I found my true self today and all restraints have crumbled. I'm the pitiless battle axe of Purshuram. I will rid the world of the warrior caste. I will bring universal peace. I'm the plow on Balarama's shoulder. In an effortless outburst of creative joy, I will pull up this enslaved world, root and all. I'm the quintessential rebel, battle weary, but I will rest only when the anguished cries of the oppressed cease to resonate in air and sky. When oppressors' swords are driven off the field, only then will I rest a battle-weary rebel. I am the rebel sage, Brigu. I inscribe my footprint on the deity's breast. I am the creator's slayer. I will split asunder the breast of whimsical providence. I am the perennial rebel hero. My head 
ever held high, rises far above earth. That's wonderful. Such a beautiful translation. Um, I would like to take the next 10 minutes or so and ask Kaiser a few questions. Um, and then we'll have time to hear from Professor Aung Shimon Kaur, and then maybe we'll have time for some additional conversation. Um, I have read, as I'm sure many of you have, many translations in English of Bidrohi, um, all of them uh, slightly different. Um, and I wonder, uh, Kaiser, if you could tell us how you approached doing this, how you did it, and whether you can, whether you read other translations before doing your own, whether you're conscious of um, how your translation differs from those of others who have gone before. So I'm just interested in your method of translating. Well, um, I, I, I write poetry in English. Um, and translating is no different from uh, writing a poem of my own. Um, the old, only difference is that, I mean, the raw material is already a finished product. So I have to sort of take it apart and then put it back together in uh, the target language. Now, um, Nazul Islam is not a poet or writer I often read. So um, to me, he's a late romantic, um, but I have become interested. So I, I will read him uh, thoroughly and sort of um, try to give my take on him because there are things in him which are very modern as well. <clears throat> Um, he was an experimenter in verse. I mean, uh, he, you know, you can see that uh, um, just following, um, uh, just after Rabindranath, I mean, he, he strikes a very different note. Um, I once wrote a little piece on uh, the influence of American poetry on uh, South Asian poetry. And there's a brief passage on Nozul where I said, in fact, I compared the Bidrohi to um, the song of myself, Whitman's. And I said, well, um, there are striking similarities in the way this, uh, he, uh, you have a protean self which encompasses everything. Of course, um, there's more, more violence here, I think. And I said that as far as the verse is concerned, Whitman writes, I mean, he is the first great poet who wrote exclusively in free verse. He is actually the, the father of modern free verse. And whereas uh, Nazrul in his uh, verse, um, he, you know, relies heavily on um, you know, intricate uh, patterns of rhymes, uh, you know, there's a lot of alliteration and all that. Um, and I said, it's, uh, uh, he, he, he's a bit like, uh, you know, um, Whitman rewritten by Rudyard Kipling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because Kipling also sort of loves to uh, play around with, you know, uh, rhyme schemes and, you know, intricate uh, sound patterns and all that. Um, uh, and that, but uh, when I was uh, asked to translate this poem, uh, in fact, uh, Niyazapa, Niyazaman, he uh, suggested two poems, this one and Shatul uh, Aram. Um, I managed to do this, and <laughs> but I, I, before I could take that up, I said, it's just time to go to press. I said, um, I, I give up for the time being, I, maybe later on. <laughs> um, now, in translating him, I faced the same problem as Rabindranath did when he was translating his Gitanjali. Again, it, it, the original is, uh, uses intricate um, sound patterns, rhymes. So he sort of uh, 
went uh, did a, a 180 degrees turn, as it were, and sort of went in the opposite direction and uh, wrote in a kind of cadenced uh, pro prose. Now, um, what I thought would work here is that I, I thought that, you know, um, that that approach would not work here because the beauty of the poem lies in its um, in, in, in the vigor of its verse, the, the strength of its cadences. Um, I decided, of course, not to try to uh, use rhyme at all. And I think, uh, you know, in general, if you are translating uh, poetry from uh, uh, rhymed poetry into English, uh, as a general rule, and uh, here I, think, um, I, I follow Ramanuja, who, who also used to follow this principle that um, don't try to, uh, you know, b bother about uh, this rhyme. Uh, you know, it's um, there are other things which are more important. So the the imagery, the the cadence. I mean, the co again, the concept of music and poetry the, is. Um, <laughs> To the popular imagination, it's it's rhyme. So I mean, you know, um, but um, rhyme is uh, in the history of poetry is a fairly recent innovation. <laughs> you know, so all the you know, the ancient poetry it's uh, all unrhymed. Um, so the, the really important thing is to uh, work on the, the the rhythms, the cadences. But I yeah, yeah. I was just going to ask you. Um, let me add another question in while you're speaking. Um, a, 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 you could answer the rhyme as well as this one. One thing that I have noticed over the years in looking at English translations is that many people leave things out of Bidruhi. Um, if you look at the early and very celebrated translation of Kubir Choudhury, for instance, uh, he leaves out many stanzas and he changes a few things. Um, he leaves out, for instance, he changes the um, the cremation ground to a graveyard in the English. Uh, he omits poison quaffing Shiva, Ganges, the Ganges in Shiva's hair. He omits references to Om. Uh, he it omits completely um, the rather violent image of the tearing into the, uh, the, but you put a uh, tearing into tatters, the earth mother's sorry with my teeth. He omits that. Um, and he admits completely the idea of, of the next to last stanza of inscribing my footprints on the deity's breast and splitting aside the chest of, of whimsical providence. Anyway, I noticed with pleasure that you didn't omit anything. <laughs> and I wondered, whether you had any, um, whether you, what you think about translations that change or omit and, and w w whether you, um, how you approach uh, a poem in which you feel that some things might not be understood by the target audience or that you don't particularly like. Yeah. Anyway, so I was wondering about that as well. Well, I, I mean, there are many translations where things are left out. And um, it's uh, the, translation, the translator's choice. But um, th there should be a rationale behind it. Now, I don't know when Professor Gabi Chaudhuri did that translation. In fact, I haven't read the whole of it. Uh, frankly, I haven't read the, uh, all the translations. Um, and, and the, the translations of uh, Bengali poetry into English that I come across, I'm, I find them pretty dull. And, uh, they don't work as poetry, really. Very few do. So, um, uh, you know, I just uh, glanced at it. Um, I wonder if he did it before 1971, I think. He did. He did. He did it in the 60s. Yeah. When Ayub Khan was uh, ruling Pakistan, hence the Islamization. So, cremation ground becomes graveyard, etc., etc. Omens left out. 
So um, that, that's, um, that's possible. Yeah. That's but even, yeah. even some more recent translators omit things. Um, so the fact that you didn't, I, I find um, uh, very reassuring. Um, tell, tell us also um, whether in doing the translation, sometimes when you render something from your one language into another, you, you read the original differently after a while. In other words, doing the translation causes you to have a different in, uh, relationship with the original. And I'm wondering if that happened to you at all and in what way? Um, I, 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 I think what happened in my case is that, well, I, the, I took the original and then started, I, I mean, playing around. And uh, once I had got the draft down, you see, then um, I just set the original aside and just worked on the, you know, ah. trying to see how I could, you know, make it work better as poetry. You know. So uh, testing the lines, you know, reading them aloud and you know, getting the rhythm and all that. Um, so. Um, what did you find no, most I, difficult? What was your what was the biggest challenge in doing this? I don't know. <laughs> I, you know honestly, my, my my approach to writing is very simple. You just plunge in. It's like <laughs> you know, here's a um, a river or sea or ocean. You plunge in and try to swim. <laughs> you know, and, um, so I mean, once you're in the water. Yes, I mean, concent and then you concentrate on your strokes, you know, which strokes go best, you know, with the material, you know. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, the, the, my sort of uh, reaction to this uh, task is the same as um, my reaction to actually writing my own poem. Yes. Again, I mean, I don't know, um, you know, when things work, I don't know where things come from. <laughs> but okay. so I really um, do believe that um, Eliot got it right when he said that the poet's mind is like a receptacle and all sorts of things uh, collect there and suddenly the, you know, there's a kind of, kind of uh, fusion of elements and the uh, poetic product emerges. I think um, given the time that we should turn to Professor Angshuman Kaur and let him speak, um, and then we'll have about five minutes or more at the end and we can open it up and uh, other audience members can speak to you or to Professor Kaur. Um, is that all right with you, uh, Professor Kaur? Yeah, it's all right with me, Rachel, and uh, sorry yeah. about uh, this delay because I'm traveling and right now I'm not in my hometown, I'm in Malda oh. <laughs> because of uh, commitments uh, relating to poetry, of course. And that's why uh, a little bit delay, I missed uh, Professor Hawks, but though I have read it already, but I, I, I could get his comments as well. Right. So that's all right. Absolutely all right with me. And I'm extremely sorry to the organizers and to all the other participants, but sometimes things are not at all in your control. And I was having, you know, also connectivity, you know, issues as well. So missed a little bit of this and um, it's a great miss on my part. <laughs> I, I hope that uh, later on Samsad will, uh, you know, send me the recording of whatever, you know, has gone before I joined the session. So you please, uh, you please give your remarks. Um, we have about uh, a little less than 20 minutes. So if you give your remarks and then maybe there will be some time at the end for some discussion. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rachel. And uh, You're thank, you, Professor, thank you, Professor Hawk. Good morning to all my colleagues, young researchers and friends as well. Look, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a poem. And one thing I should tell you that uh, I am really impressed by the way uh, Professor Hawk has translated, you know, this poem. It's, it's a brilliant work, splendid job, because 
I also uh, keep on translating a few pieces uh, from English to Bengali and from Bengali to English as well. And how difficult it is to translate a poem like Vidrohi that I know, and he has been able to do, to, to do justice to his job. I'm really uh, impressed and I, 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 I congratulate, you know, Professor Hawk for doing a splendid uh, job. Anyway, so as I told you that I'll be talking basically about the socio-political perspective uh, from which I think that we should read uh, Najrul's Vidrohi. And I hope that uh, all of us, we know that uh, it's a poem uh, which was written by uh, uh, Nazrul, uh, uh, you know, at one go, right? And uh, uh, Kakabab, who, uh, uh, whom we in Bengal actually, I mean, in West Bengal, we call Kakabab, who was one of the key factors in establishing, you know, the Communist Party of uh, India in India. And he was a kind of a mentor of Kaji Nazrul when he was writing Vidrohi. And in fact, both of them, they, 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 they shared a room. And uh, uh, if you read, you know, uh, Muzaffar Ahmed's, uh, you know, recollections about how this poem was composed, then clearly, uh, uh, you know, he has written that uh, this poem was written by Nazrul, um, you know, at one go, uh, you know, uh, uh, in night and uh, if I read it, you know, in, in Bangla, I have not been able to translate it into English. Uh, Muzaffar Ahmed wrote something like this. Uh, for for those of you who don't understand Bengali, I'll give you a kind of a, you know, nutshell of whatever was written by Muzaffar Ahmed in English. He wrote that uh, She, that is Nojrul Islam, of course. Kobita ti likhe jilo ratri tre, ratri kum shomay ta ami jani ne. Rat doshtar pore ami ghumiya pore chilam shakale ghum teke uthe mukthu e, ami poshe chhi aman shomay Nojrul bollo chhe, Kobita likhe chhe. Puro Kobita ti shetakun ami pore shonalo, Vidrohi Kobita ami patham shrota. So Muzaffar Ahmed was actually saying that uh, it's a it's a poem that was written by Nojrul at one go and probably, uh, you know, uh, using the whole night uh, during uh, which Muzaffar Ahmed was asleep and in the morning when he woke up, Nazrul read out the poem to him uh, and it was written, of course, in a kind of a trance, right? And uh, Kakababu, Muzaffar Ahmed claims that he was the first, uh, you know, uh, listener uh, who, who, who listened to this poem of Nazrul and uh, <clears throat> he also has predicted that probably uh, Nazrul, you know, woke up and then uh, in the middle of his sleep, actually, he woke up and then he wrote uh, this poem. Uh, and that's why he has said that otherwise it was not possible for him to read out the poem so early in the morning, right? <laughs> um, usually he used to wake up very late. This is also what uh, Muzaffar Ahmed actually wrote. My point is that, uh, that it was written in a trance, but we should not think that it's a poem that came to him in a way, because I would like to argue, in, in, this is my way of looking at Vidrohi, that it was something which was a product of uh, the, the, the socio-political uh, dynamics that shaped Kajino's rule as a poet as well. In fact, uh, it has also been pointed out by Muzaffar Ahmed that the entire poem was written by Nuzrul using a pencil. Now, uh, and the kind of reception that the poem got, that also we all know, I'm not going to uh, talk much about that. Uh, it was published in two uh, journals almost simultaneously, uh, uh, first in Bijoli and then, of course, in uh, Muslim Bharat. We all know that uh, how the poem was received also by, by the common readers, how uh, uh, Bijoli was uh, uh, reprinted, 29,000 copies, uh, you know, just because of this poem, uh, the popularity of the poem was uh, huge and unthinkable, unbelievable. In fact, Someone like Buddhadev Boshu has always been very critical of, uh, of, of um, uh, you know, uh, or rather about perceiving art in general. He was also full of praise for this particular poem of Nazrul. But uh, these are, uh, you know, issues that um, I would not like to uh, focus uh, upon right now. My point is that though the poem was written in trance, it was the result of, as I've told you, it was the result of, uh, 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 I would like to say, uh, the 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 anti-colonial the nationalist discourse that was uh, that was almost uh, that was you know taking a shape and almost got a shape by the time Nuzrul was uh, writing this poem, and I like to that's why I point out that uh, the word that is repeated uh, uh, the most, which 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 recurs, you know, all through the poem is Ami, I, 
right? Uh, the, the, the poem in Mangla begins like, like this, right? It ends also with that, right? I mean, Vidrohi Bhrigu Bhagavan Bukhe Padochindra. Now, uh, this is something which uh, this I, 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 would not, I would not accept this I simply as the I that represents an individual. Rather, this I is a collective I, is a collective I. And I'd like to also argue that this I was the product of, uh, of course, uh, the, 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 the enlightenment, uh, uh, discourses and also of uh, humanism, right? Uh, 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 which contributed a lot to what we call uh, Bengali Renaissance, you know, on a, on, a, on a small scale and on a larger scale also the Indian Renaissance. Though I, sh I should point this out that there are differences between uh, what is known as Bengali Renaissance and uh, Renaissance that, that took place in some other parts of India at the time, for instance, uh, Bengali Renaissance was more or less the product of uh, the elites. It was a kind of an elitist, uh, you know, uh, discourse, and uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, uh, I should say uh, activism as well. For instance, in Kerala, if you look at the the the, the, the Renaissance in Kerala uh, in the early part of the 20th century, the participation in the Bengali Renaissance. My point is that the participation of, in, in the Bengali Renaissance of the non-Hindus, uh, uh, non-elite, subalterns, uh, that was very limited. Najrul was, of course, an exception in this regard, but that was in general limited. But if you look at the Renaissance of Kerala, you will find that all these you know, um, uh, people uh, uh, representing all these sections, they, they took very active part in the Renaissance of Kerala. So I'm distinguishing these two forms of uh, uh, Renaissance as well, but more or less, as I've told you, that it, it was a, a kind of an anti-colonial uh, discourse that fought uh, colonialism, and uh, of course, uh, this I, in a, in, in a way, which in Bangla we call uh, Oshmita, right? So in that sense, it, it is, it is, as I've told you, not only the Oshmita of an individual, not only the sense of pride uh, with which uh, you know uh, Renaissance, uh, of course, asserted itself in Bengal. It's it's a collective why. In that sense, we need to, and that's why remember that the poem was received uh, so well because people could identify themselves with this eye of the poem. What they could not write, but they thought of writing, they thought of uttering. All those things were actually written by Kaji Nazrul Islam, and this is the first point that I'd like to underline that. We need to read the poem, though written in a trance, but as uh, as Najrul's engagement, a kind of a conscious engagement, though he was very young at that time, and he grew up also as an intellectual and as a thinker later on with time, but it was a kind of a conscious in engagement of Najrul with the anti-colonial, uh, you know, uh, I should call the uh, nationalist discourses of India, and to be uh, more specific of Bengal. And that is how the poem actually uh, you know, uh, uh, was born. So this is something that uh, if, if a few questions come, I'd like to elaborate uh, uh, more on this point later on. So this is point number one that I'd like to uh, underline about this poem. And we need to situate the poem against this context. This is number one. Number two, uh, I'd like to refer to a kind of a debate for coming to which, which of course, uh, is a part of the uh, later life of Mazdul, when he almost became a kind of a celebrity, and he was touring, you know, uh, the entire Bengal. I mean, uh, what now is your Bangladesh, which I consider very much as uh, my country as well. You know, the borders are always fake and porous. Uh, he was touring, uh, of course, uh, entire West Bengal and, uh, you know, East Bengal or Bangladesh, whatever you call it. And at that time, you know, he, 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 he received a letter from someone who was also a great intellectual of that era and who was deeply talking about promoting something that he, 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 he called Muslim Shahitto, right? The literature related to Islam. And, 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 and he, he, he was arguing that Nujrul should lead you know that process of uh, building up what is called islamic literature in bengal right now we are uh, we are perceiving a kind of a revival of that trend a few organizations have also uh, come out who, which are arguing that uh, there is something which could be called uh, islamic literature in bengal in bangla nazrul was opposing this 
clearly opposing this. Once again, I just like to read out a portion from uh, one of his letters, which because of the constraint of time, I, I have not been able to translate into English and I'm not that good at translate like Professor Hawke as well. So let me read it out in Bangla and then I'll, I'll uh, of course, once again, give you the, 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 the essence of what Nazrul was um, writing in English. He wrote to Ibrahim Khan, that apnar muslim sahitya kotha tar mane ni onek musalman sahitya ki kotha tulben hoyto or mane ki musalmaner shreshtho sahitya na muslim bhabapanno sahitya sahitya jodi shottikarer sahitya hoy tobe tar sokol jatir hi hoy tobe tar baire ekta form thakbe nischoy islam dharmer shottyo niye kabbo rochona cholte pare kintu tar shastro niye cholbe na islam keno kono dharmer i shastro niye kabbo lekha chole bole ami bishwas kori na ইসলামের সত্যকার প্রাণশক্তি গণতন্ত্রবাদ সার্বজনীন ভাতৃত্ব ও সমানাধিকার বাদ ইসলামের এই অভিনবত্ব শ্রেষ্ঠত্ব আমি তো স্বীকার করি যারা ইসলাম ধর্মাবলম্বী নন তারাও স্বীকার করেন ইসলামের এই মহান সত্যকে কেন্দ্র করে কাব্য কেন মহাকাব্য সৃষ্টি করা যেতে পারে আমি ক্ষুদ্র কবি আমার বহু লেখার মধ্যে দিয়ে আমি ইসলামের এই মহিমা গানই করেছি তবে কাব্যকে ছাপিয়ে ওঠেনি সে গানের সুর তাহলে তা কাব্য হবে না very clear nazrul is that there cannot be anything like islamic uh, literature and it has to be literature first of all you cannot promote religion he was praising you know the positive aspects of uh, of islam right uh, kind of democracy a, a kind of universal fraternity equity which islam uh, talks about and celebrates but he, he he was saying that i have acknowledged all these things in so many of my writings but you cannot claim that i should initiate the process of creating something that could be called uh, you know, Muslim Shahid, Islamic literature. This is something which is very much evident in, in, in Bidrohi. Bidrohi should be read as a secular poem, as a poem that was questioning this, this, this uh, ethical stance of creating Islamic literature. Consciously, Najdul was doing this. And that's why it's a poem that uses meats not only from Islam, but also from uh, uh, Hindu Puranas and also from, uh, uh, you know, uh, very famous, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, storehouse of European myths. And that's why Orpheus is there. So many things. Uh, and of course, let me tell you that uh, of let uh, people are working a lot on how, uh, you know, uh, in Bangla poetry, uh, uh, there has been an attempt by some of the poets to create something that could be called Shiva literature. And this is a poem in which, if you look at uh, uh, Vitrohi, in how many forms Lord Shiva has been mentioned, in how many forms, unthinkable. And I would also like to argue that this was the beginning of, 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 the, of, the, of the creation of that, 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 that kind of literature that, that, that uh, examines and re-examines the influence of Shiva, right? My point is that this is the Nazrul who would later on write the most famous uh, uh, some of the immortal, uh, you know, uh, songs related to Kali, Shama Shungit, uh, in, 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 in Bangladesh and in West Bengal, uh, we can't think of Shama Shungit without Kaji Nazrul Islam. And this was the beginning, meaning my point is that it's a poem that was not only the result of, as I told you that, uh, Nazrul's conscious engagement with the anti-colonial nationalist discourses and that's why the I represents a, 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 a collective self and not at all the individual self of the poet himself but it was also of course definitely it was also of course definitely another attempt of of proving that literature has to be literature ultimately this is something which was needed, very much needed, because we have seen that in, in Bangladesh also, I might sound a bit political, but we have seen that Nazrul, oftentimes uh, Nazrul has been tried to, uh, try, uh, or rather I, I'd say that state has tried to appropriate Nazrul as a, as a kind of a Muslim poet, which he was not, which he, 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 he should not be uh, 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 called at all. He could not be bracketed into, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know uh, uh, that, that kind of a category. He should not be, he sh should not be dumped there. And that's why my point is, but such attempts have been made. We know that how, uh, how some of the words of Nazrul poems have, uh, 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 were altered, attempts were there to alter. So this is a wrong way of approaching Nazrul and the essence of Nazrul Islam as a poet uh, we get actually this poem in this poem, Bidrohi. And that's why 
when you talk about Oshampradaik Bangalito, right, when you talk about Bengali nationalism, which is of course secular, which has nothing to do with religion, when you if we if we look at the identity of uh, of uh, a Bengali, what about the Bengali identity? I would always like to argue that uh, that that it's a cultural and linguistic identity for me. These are the first two things that we should keep in mind. And these were the first two things that were important to Nuzrul as well. And that's why he was contesting Ibrahim Khan later on in a letter. And that is something which he did, which he did in Bidhri also. He, he was trying to, trying to give, uh, construct a Bengali identity, which was absolutely secular and dependent on, as I've told you, uh, the culture of Bengal, which includes uh, both uh, Hinduism and Islam, and of course, of course, uh, I, I would say, I would say Europe as well, partly hybrid product it was, and uh, he was celebrating that in this poem. So this is the second point that I'd like to uh, underline. I would end my comments on this poem with uh, the third point, which is also very important to me, and that is about the ending of the poem when Nojul writes that I'm Bidrohi Bhrigu Bhagavan Muke Eke Devo Padochi. Look, this is what we call courage. You know, not even courage. In Bangla, in one of my Bengali articles, I have actually differentiated between, uh, you know, two, two uh, very important uh, uh, concepts in Bangla. One is uh, called courage, ahosh, and the other Bengali word is himmot. I have, I have called this himmot of Nazrul, which is bigger than uh, what you call courage, you know. And that is something which Bengal desperately needed at the time, which India desperately needed at the time. You know, uh, if, you, if, you, if you ask any poet in, 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 in India to write a line like this, I mean, Bidruhi Bhrigu, Bhagavan Bukhe Eke Drebo Pado Chinno, he will be behind bar immediately. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, such is the condition of uh, the entire subcontinent, perhaps. Unfortunate disease, but he had the courage to write a line like this, a line like this. It, it's not simply courage. I don't know. Professor Hawk um, might help me, you know, in finding out a better word for um, uh, himmoth, what in Bengal we call himmoth, or what should be the English word for that. But I'd like to argue that this is perhaps the most important part of this poem, that it, 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 it is a demonstration of Kaji Nazrul Islam's himmoth, right? And that is something which was badly needed then. That is something which is badly needed even now to fight fundamental forces across the globe. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, wonderful comments. So we've been given by the um, organizers an extra six or seven minutes. Um, and I'd like to open the floor to questions from uh, our listeners that could be directed either at uh, Professor Kaur or Professor Hawk, um, uh, either about the translation or about the poem in general. So please uh, use the hand function and um, we would love to hear from you. If no one wants to ask a question, then maybe I can ask Professor, uh, well, Professor Huck to respond to Professor Kaur or just for them to talk to one another briefly about the points made. Um, Ang Shuman, you asked uh, Kaiser uh, what, you, what he would uh, say about the courage part. Uh, at, at the end of the poem, maybe, maybe the two of you can speak to each other. I mean, yes, I mean, uh, this is a tremendous sort of, you know, the shoot spa in the Nazru, you know, uh, to, to use a, an English word borrowed from Yiddish, I suppose. So that shoot spa, you know, that, that daring to sort of um, break taboos, as it were, you know, almost. Yeah, I mean, he's actually breaking taboos. Yeah. Um, and and uh, the vision is, of course, that's all embracing the Um it, it, 
Is this a secular poem? Um, I'm not very sure. You know why? Because he's embracing all the sort of religious and pagan, I mean, the Semitic religions, the Greek yeah. uh, cults, Hinduism. Um, yeah. So, I mean, uh, that all embracing this is one thing. I mean, the word secular somehow to me, you know, it, as in the traditional um, understanding of the word in the Western context, means that you leave religion aside and you deal with the secular world, and the, the secular realm, which... You know, can I, can I just, uh, can I just respond to Professor Hawk to this comment of yours? Because my understanding of, I'm fully aware of the, the, the way the word secular has been perceived, but in that sense, I have not used the word in, in, in this talk of mine, because you know, I think that I think that uh, true secularism. Uh, in fact, uh, this is true about India. I, I don't know about the reality of uh, uh, Bangladesh right now, uh, but uh, just off let what happened, and we 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 also organized a protest against that in West Bengal. I uh, my my take on secularism is this: that secularism should not erase religion. Rather. You know, you know, when, 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 uh, if you read uh, Swami Vivekananda and uh, the way, uh, or even Ramakrishna also, whom I, whom I consider to be secular as well. So I personally believe that, uh, forget about the Western discourses on secularism. If we look at uh, our own history, uh, the history of Bengal, undivided Bengal, then I would like to argue that this form of secularism perhaps works better, works better than that kind of secularism, which uh, negates or rejects religion, right? Because this is a spirit of uh, inclusion that I'm talking about. Meaning if you look at secularism as something that excludes religion, I think that it, it does not work, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, uh, that much um, uh, as it works, if it becomes inclusive. Now, there could be a debate on this. In fact, uh, perhaps the Marxists don't at all accept, accept this kind of a definition of the secular. And I'm sure that you also uh, would not accept this kind of a take on secularism. But I sincerely believe that if you look at the history of uh, our subcontinent, uh, bypassing religion, you cannot achieve secularism. That will create problems. And that's why my argument is that Nazrul was actually, meaning this point, uh, I completely agree with you that it's a poem about inclusive all the religions and myths related to all the religions. And I would like to call this a kind of a secular check in Bangla, which I'd like to call Sampradayik Bangalitto. In that sense, I have actually used that Nozrul was actually celebrating. Now, we can have a debate on this definitely, but uh, with, with due respect to whatever you have said and uh, to your scholarship, I would very, once again, politely like to point out that my take on secularism is a bit different now. I was uh, also, also, or rather, I used to think about secularism the way you are talking about secularism now, but with, with time, uh, it's a kind of a, you, you can say my own personal uh, realization that we need to perhaps fall back on someone like Sri Ramakrishna while talking about, you know, secularism, the inclusive form of secularism actually I'm talking about, not at all, uh, secularism as a mode of exclusion. I don't know how much of this you'll accept. I think what we, no, we're no, almost no, out no. of time. Let's uh, let Professor Hawk respond and then I think we'll have to end. But so Professor Hawk, Please. No, I have no problem with that, actually. Sort of, um, uh, perhaps um, I would say that this is a secular mind, in the sense, uh, a mind that is not uh, governed by any re particular religion. A secular mind um, creating a poem in a culture, in a world where all these uh, religious forces operate and uh, he gives an inclusive vision which you know uh, enable, would enable us to transcend you know um, 
sectarian, religious, communal differences. Yeah, so I'm there, I'm with you. Okay. Um, but uh, when you think about the, um, you know, about separating church from state and creating a secular realm, one pro problem that I uh, would like to point out regarding the subcontinent is that, you see, in all the three, three countries that um, emerged out of you know, greater India, you have uh, separate personal laws for the different religious groups. Oh, that's true, yeah. So in a secular polity, you should have the same law for everyone. everyone. And it's really, I mean, I, and the present circumstances, it's, it's, it's impossible to conceive of that kind of a polity where you have, you know, uh, a, a, a laws which are the same for everybody. But then how can you operate in praxis? That, that was I, my point. I know, it, 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 this is a big problem. I mean, this is a problem for, for our culture, for, for yeah. our political culture, for our subcontinent, for our civilization. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm just, I just, just want to... to the, Point this out, but I mean, uh, as far as uh, the your interpretation of this, uh, those questions, this is I'm totally. And uh, I mean, you mentioned Ram Krishna, uh, who practiced different religions. Uh, he would, you know, yeah. probably spend spend some time yeah. as a practicing Muslim yeah. right, sometimes yeah. practicing Christian yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. The the mark of an excellent panel is one where people want to keep talking. And uh, I think that this has been a marvelous um, hour long engagement on uh, Bidrohi and Nosrul and, um, and our society and uh, religion. And so um, I'm so grateful that uh, Mehek and uh, everyone uh, invited me. And um, I feel as though I have some new friends and new colleagues and I'm just delighted. and. Um, thank you for uh, listening, and um, I think probably we need to end so that there can be other other panels. But um, please uh, join me in thanking the panelists, and uh, I'm just really delighted at everything I personally have learned. And that was a very good translation. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank, thank you, Professor and thank you. You're doing a lovely job. Thank, Thank you. you, Professor Rock. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, really, it, it was a wonderful session. It was wonderful. Both of you spoke so beautifully. Thank you. So both of you are here, but let me tell you that I'm in Malla, not in my hometown, and there's uh, some some works uh, to be done. So I'll miss your talk. So both of you, please uh, see you later. Many, many, many thanks. To the panelists, Professor Rachel McDermott, Professor Kaiser Hawk, Professor Anshuman Kaur, 